Thank you, and good morning, everybody. As I was listening to Jason uh, recall the uh, first session of uh, annual conference, it was an annual conference, the first conference of, of the center, and it was very vivid in my mind as he described it. And it really is extraordinary, uh, not only how much has been accomplished by the center, the critical role it's played, but the contribution uh, it, it made, it has made, and I want to say, and just join me in congratulating Jason, but congratulating the entire team that's made this possible. So uh, when I published uh, the new map, some of the reviewers said, why are you writing about geopolitics in a book about energy? Uh, what does that have to do with energy? And the question, as I think we've learned over the last year, it has to do quite a lot with energy. So uh, I'm very pleased that we have this opportunity uh, to have this discussion about geopolitics and how it ties into energy and the kind of dominating role it plays. Uh, we'll talk about Russia and Ukraine and impacts. We'll talk about China, uh, US China, and we'll talk about the Middle East. Um, when I wrote my first book, which was not about energy, it was about the origins of the Cold War, I never imagined that I would be writing a new book about a new Cold War. And uh, yet that's what I found I was doing when I was writing the new map. And uh, so we'll start with Russia. The deputy Russian foreign minister recently said, just a few days ago, he said, actually, we're not in a cold war. He said, we're in a new phase of a hot war. So things have changed pretty dramatically. And that's where we'll start. And I'd like to just begin uh, by asking uh, Ian, what is the state of uh, the war with, with Russia and what to expect? Yeah, well, I'm glad you asked it uh, in terms of the war with Russia, because that's the problem. Uh, I mean, we can, we, we're talking about Ukraine for the last year, and of course, they're suffering immensely. But from a geopolitical perspective, the most dangerous thing here is that we uh, now have Russia as a rogue state, led by a man that we consider to be a war criminal. And there's no way out of that. Uh, that's, that is, it's the most dangerous rogue state of my lifetime. And when I think about the way that war criminals end up, whether it's Gaddafi or Bashir or Milosevic, it's not like you can sit down and engage and patch it up. And I also think we have to recognize just how close we are to a new Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, you know, when you saw the intelligence leak and the fact that a British spy plane, and how close it was to being shot out of the sky by the Russians uh, over the Black Sea, uh, I mean, this, this is a war where the Americans and NATO are directly providing surveillance and intelligence. They are directly providing training. They're pro directly providing weapons, all for very legitimate reasons. Um, this was an illegal war uh, by Russia, of course. Uh, but the fact is that um, the, the free, wh whether you're talking about NATO expansion or the freezing of Russian assets, all the rest, none of this, this is generational. And so I, I do think that the, in, if you look at the geopolitical landscape, there's nothing that is more dangerous for the coming 10, 20 years out there um, than, than what is presently so, being experienced in Russia. So let me ask you and then ask Anna. Uh, no one would have, I think probably a year ago, a little over a year ago, Vladimir Putin would not have expected that this war would extend as long as it has. He thought it was going to be over in five days. And they all brought their dress uniforms uh, to march in the parade in Kiev. Uh, I want to ask you. What, how do you see it unfolding next year? And then ask Anna to, to address that. I, in terms of the war in Ukraine itself, I, I think that you know, wh whenever this Ukrainian counteroffensive comes, if it comes, they'll be able to take some territory, probably. Um, and the Russians are unlikely to be able to dramatically redress that in the next 6, 12 months. I, I don't think we will be talking as much about Ukraine in a year. If we are, it's mostly because the West is starting to fragment in how much support they're providing. You know, some of that may be France and China together, some of that may be Trump getting the mm -hmm. nomination, but, but the challenge of dealing with Russia in the coming year is going to get much worse. So, Anna, let me ask you from the viewpoint of a European, how do you see the stance of Europe, or is there a single, still a single stance yep. of Europe? For us in Europe, the first thing that we have to highlight is that the U.S. is back. So, in a transatlantic relation, this is fundamental. And that the U.S. is back, just coming from a moment, the, the leaving Kabul that was the worst moment in the image. And paradoxically, the U.S. has won, so far, the narrative. 
the narrative uh, just war. And that for us is fundamental because this is what has had the repercussion of European Union being united. And the, the unity is a unity backed by someone, something that Ian touched upon. Spain, for instance, we have no tradition of confrontation with or Italy. We have no tradition of confrontation with Russia. We have of Russia a very romantic idea. But today, the polls point out that our biggest threat is Russia. So why, why has that happened? Why have the European population? Well, I think, that, I, mean, I think that there is a deep idea that Putin has crossed some elementary lines of human decency. And then even if, if you don't have a history, if you are not Poland or you are not the Baltics, you feel that. So unity in, uh, in Europe is, is important. And I think that Europe has delivered we, in practical terms. We connected the, the, the electricity. We just did the roaming. Now, the challenge, beyond the challenge military that we all are facing and beyond the threats of just nuclear or otherwise, our challenge is the accession. The accession of Ukraine can pull tension. By accession, you mean accession to, to the European Union? No, this is the problem, is that until now, all the former, all the former Soviet Union or all the former Warsaw Pact members of the European Union joined the European Union after having joined NATO. But this time, as we have seen in the last NATO uh, foreign affairs meetings, is that there is no, I mean, there is no consensus in, in having a, a program for accession in NATO for Ukraine, or at least this is what was filtered. Do you think that would be wise to have? I mean, would that? Would that fulfill exactly what Putin said he was fighting? Uh, you know, we have been all the time thinking that we are going to provoke. This comes from Bucharest. So it's not from, to, from today. But the, the problem is that what is the alternative? Is to have a member of the European Union, not just a rump member. Until now, as I say, it was first NATO, then the European Union. It's not just that. It's that it's, we have Cyprus that just was the, the, the contradiction that we con cannot have a member that has contested uh, frontiers. But this time it would be much worse so, without NATO. So last June, Vladimir Putin gave a speech in St. Petersburg where he laid out a strategy, his, econ his strategy of uh, economic warfare. He said high energy prices, high natural gas prices will create economic hardship in Europe, will create social turmoil, will bring populist governments to power, and as he put it in a very strange Marxist language, will change the elites in Europe. That hasn't worked, right? It Europe, hasn't. Europe, Europe's not. I mean, honestly, it has surprised me. And I think many uh, died in the wool a European Union is so, uh, that the way our citizens are reacting and the unity between the institutions and the member states, not, notwithstanding some uh, just mis, mis spoken, right. not, very, not very good sentences, but that's, Who that's you like, about? well, you know, someone north of the Pyrenees. North, north not too of, far north of the Pyrenees. Not too far Just think about north the map, of the you get the idea. But you, but you know, why, why is he doing that? Uh, because, you know, you have, you, you have a politician has to be uh, also in, in the, the public opinion, the national public opinion. And the, the, the situation, social situation, in this specific country is not great. In fact, I mean, at the same time that uh, the President of the Republic was just uh, interacting with design Chinese citizens, because these were design Chinese citizens, uh, the, in Paris, the offices of BlackRock were burned. So again, Right. There are things so just, in European she, Union, sorry. Yeah. So we, by using the word Paris, I think we know what leader you're Well, we, we are speaking about Emmanuel Macron. Emmanuel Macron is someone, of course, is someone. I have written when he gave his first speech at the Sorbonne. This, were, this was a fantastic project for the European Union. And what, what is highlighted from this side of the pond, and I understand it, is this is perceived as distancing from the United States. I think that Europe knows best. We, we cannot do it. 
Uh, the French are the French, and we just have to go back to the goal to see the, the I mean, it's peculiarities. We, we, are, we have different cultures. But the, the truth about it is that there has been unity, that the support of the war effort has been much better, Spar starting by my own government, that the first declaration was, well, you know, Spain will not. And then one week later, we were there. We were right. as everybody else. Right. Well, let me turn now to the energy implications, because at least before the war, Russia was an energy superpower. Uh, Putin was once asked, uh, is Russia an energy superpower? This is years ago, and he said, oh, I don't like that term because it sounds kind of Cold War-ish. But of course, it is a Cold War now, and it was a superpower. Whether it will continue to be an energy superpower, I think will depend a lot about how the energy map has changed because of the war. And let me go to Megan and talk about what are the energy impacts now that we see? Sure. Um, thank you, Dan, and good morning, everyone. I, I just um, want to make two points reflecting the conversation thus far, mostly because I just love to disagree with Ian. Um, and I think we still will be talking a lot about Ukraine in a year. I just think the nature of the conversation is going to be very different than it has been thus far, as Anna suggested. Um, we're going to be talking a lot more about diplomacy and negotiations, about security assurances, about reconstruction. All of those things have the potential for being positive, but also have the potential for being divisive. So I think while I completely agree with the assessment that Europe has way outperformed expectations on the political side and in terms of unity, and um, that it, it, the, the game is not over in the sense that Putin's strategy still has time to play out, especially as we look at the energy situation that Europe may face in the coming winter and some of the things we know about that. But let me, Dan, just um, respond to your question in a broader sense. I think this is a group well, where- Well, maybe, Megan, just why don't you about finish about on the winter? Because, yeah. I mean, there was oh, okay. this sense this winter actually, it, it got, Europe got through it. Is it okay now? Or? Yeah, no, I mean, Europe, again, got through it for reasons that this crowd, feel pretty confident this crowd is aware of, you know, some good luck with a, uh, a summer um, that, or not a summer, a winter that might have been more like a summer. Um, but also because Europe was able to fill up a lot of its reserves actually using Russian gas. And it wasn't really until August when a lot of the Russian gas stopped flowing into Europe. And one of the reasons, there are several reasons why the next winter could be more problematic for Europe. I mean, one is the fact that it will be difficult um, to fill up reserves. It would be impossible to do that primarily with Russian gas because um, most Russian gas isn't flowing. There is still some portion of Russian gas, and in fact, Europe has become um, the, the, a, an increased importer of Russian LNG over the last year. It actually has increased its absolute value of um, LNG imports. Um, now, after the United States, Russia is Europe's largest LNG supplier, which is a, something that could change, you know, certainly subject to politics. But also, most importantly, I would say last year, the Europeans were competing with others to attract natural gas. They were competing with Bangladesh and Pakistan and other parts of the world. This year, they're going to be competing with China, now that China's opened up. So we have a lot more demand coming online, a lot more competition. And as some of you are probably aware, the IEA anticipates this is going to be a year where very little additional LNG capacity comes online. So there's all kinds of reasons why um, this energy winter, and I'm, I'm not trying to, um, uh, I'm not trying to doubt European capacity, but it, it's still something to be concerned about. Just very, very briefly, I would say, um, in terms of the energy impact, it has changed all of our conversations around this. We know how the war in Ukraine has influenced the conversation about climate security. Um, I think it still remains to be proven, but there's good reason to hope that we'll look back and say that this war helped expedite at least the European and American move away um, from carbon intensive energies. Um, we also but, have a change in energy security yeah, conversation. Let's, let's, yeah. let's not leave the carbon intensive energy for a second because it looms rather large for Russian revenues. Uh, oil price cap on Russian oil. Uh, I'm sure most people know that, uh, that we now have divided the world oil market and Russian oil doesn't go to Europe. India, which imported no Russian oil two years ago, now imports like 30% of its oil from, from Russia. Um, and I don't know, if, Megan, you, and I don't know if anybody else wants to come in. Is it a surprise that this price cap has worked, and does it continue to work? 
And, and I'd be interested in your views. I think it, it has worked. And I would say, I for one am surprised. I think a lot of people who work um, intensely on energy thought this was going to be a perversion of the markets that was going to have all kinds of unintended consequences. It's, it worked on one very important objective, which it helped keep Russian oil flowing to global markets. And I think that was the primary motivation of the Biden administration when it initiated this idea. And on that front, it's certainly been helpful. Um, on the other front about constraining Russian revenues, I mean, I would say it's probably been less helpful in the sense that the Russian discounted crude price has actually been below the price cap for most of the time. You know, there's all kinds of counterfactuals we could go into and say, well, if it had constrained Russian supply, the price would be much higher, and Russians would be getting more revenue. But I would say it, it has worked. Um, and again, with fewer implications than I expected. I think if we go back to a year ago and how the Biden administration was looking at the war, they thought at the time that the strongest tool that they had to push the Russians back was going to be the sanctions. It was the freezing of the assets, it was the economic sanctions, and they, they were very cautious about and using... And the, those other sanctions, they haven't achieved what was thought. Not at all. And, th and they, they thought the military, and they weren't as focused on the military uh, right. aspect. They weren't just focused on the technology aspect. Looking back on it now, I mean, the White House would say, we overstated what we could accomplish with economic tools, at least in the near term. Uh, but we understated what we could accomplish militarily um, by providing the Ukrainians with all this capacity, as well as the tech companies being able to provide support and, of course, stand up cyber defenses that would work. Now, that is all true, but the fact that the Americans are now comfortable getting their war on by proxy is, as I suggested, a much more dangerous place to be. Right. So let me pick up one aspect of this. And, it, you know, Jason reminded us of the conference here 10 years ago, and one of the other speakers was Tom Donilon, who had been national security assistant, and he gave a talk about the geopolitical significance of the development of U.S. shale resources, particularly LNG. Uh, Megan, you wrote about that in your book, Windfall. Uh, we've now seen something, and I'd like to just ask you, I mean, LNG, U.S. LNG, is it correct to say it's now one of the foundations of European energy security? Uh, absolutely, so. Absolutely so. And by the way, it's true that uh, the European Union has been importing more Russian LNG, and Spain is a good is a good example. It's also due to the I mean to all the the, the perfect storm that came with uh, the problems in the French nuclear, etc. But yes, we have been depending on 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 Russian LNG, and absolutely this this is the the I mean, we should try to reach some kind of bilateral agreement on the LNG with the, the European Union. Because right now, it's our dependence. And we were discussing, and, and Ian has touched upon that, how will the public react? Well, of course, we wonder how will the public react? Will there be a fatigue, as Putin is betting, but until now, Putin has proven not to be they write on his bets, starting yeah. by what was going to happen if he would invade uh, Ukraine. I think that we have to understand that, uh, that uh, LNG prices for the European Union, and especially for some countries, is a big, tall issue. And that looking into the future, we need to understand that this is going to impact other aspects and it is going to impact my first concern about all this is the unraveling of the European project. The tensions between the countries in the East, Poland and the Baltics, and the countries more in the South, with the moment in, the, in, uh, in Germany where they are still digesting the shake-up of not having Ostpolitik, of Ostpolitik does not, not working, trying to remanage this Ostpolitik towards China trying to bet on that, but it's, they are not there. France has so issues. So I, I think for this audience, a European audience would know what you mean about oh, the unraveling sorry, yeah. of the European project, but you're talking about a very important geopolitical development. Can you just explain what that is? Well, you know, the, the problem is that 
the, I mean, first, the invasion of Ukraine, for us Europeans, the first time that we have had war in the continent. And we Europeans, we understood that what we had to avoid is the periodic confrontation of France and Germany. And this is the European Union. The, the German question is behind the European construction, absolutely clear. So when people say, well, this is a market, this, no, 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 this is a political. This from day one, it's a political ambition of creating a, an area of peace. And of course, we have been uh, free, I mean, just f f free traveling with, uh, with the United States security over Europe, which has allowed Euro Europeans to bet for a long time of soft power and uh, commercial relations and understanding that the Ostpolitik, which means relations, will bring countries together. This is the, this is the summary. And this is also true uh, with, the, 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 with the present debate about China, which is a, an important debate for us. You're right, exactly. So, We're going to turn to China in just a minute, and we'll come back to it. But, we'll talk about Europe. But thank you for that clarification. Yeah. Uh, just two more questions on Russia, one for, uh, the, for Megan and one for Ian. Uh, Megan, if you were uh, doing uh, your update to your book, Windfall, about the impact of shale, what would you say in terms of the impact of U.S. LNG on geopolitics? Sure. Um, well, there's the shale question, but on the LNG question in particular, I think that much of what we anticipated would be the geopolitical impact has come to fruition in gre even greater magnitude. So the the thesis that I was arguing in the book is that America's energy revolution changes geopolitics, but not so much because it provides America with a, a, a weapon, an energy weapon that it should wield, but because it changes the geopolitical environment in ways that are conducive to American interests. And I think actually what we've seen, as we've just been discussing, is that American LNG really has helped underpin European er energy security in the biggest geopolitical crisis and, and since the end of the Second World War. So I think, you know, there's, there's no question here that America's energy prowess is playing to its geopolitical advantage. Um, and this is something that I hope our policies makers will remember if next winter, when the prices of energy go up again, um, there'll be conversations in Washington about export bans. Um, and, you know, to keep in mind that there are real geopolitical benefits to our export capacity, even though they're harder to quantify than price calculations. So let, now, just, uh, Ian, um, your latest book, Power Crisis, is, of course, sometimes power gets fragmented, sometimes power gets splintered, and although we're in the middle of it, you're deeply informed in international affairs, what's happening, government and so forth. What do you make of this daily spilling of intelligence and what the impact of it is? Well, let's keep in mind that um, the big intelligence story until this last week was the fact that the Americans were intentionally spilling intelligence um, to try to get the rest of the world paying attention that the Russians were going to invade and they were lying directly to the faces of Biden and Schultz and Macron, and I think that helped and also started to make Zelensky take it more seriously when he was resisting a general mobilization of his own. Um, the Americans tried to do the same thing with the Chinese around the weapons uh, that they were thinking about selling and were planning to sell and were trying to do so in a covert means. Uh, the fact that the Americans decided to do that publicly um, and did it together with the head of NATO and the UK uh, definitely helped to freeze the present level of U.S.-China relations. So I, I'm, I'm not answering your question no, intentionally I mean, because I think that's what, the more meaningful but, thing. And, but now it, it's the splintering of the coal, all this stuff coming out. Now somebody is doing it to the United States right. and to the Western allies and to Ukraine. Yeah. What's going on? Well, I mean, first of all, anyone that was talking um, to the U.S. administration knew about those Ukrainian capabilities and the challenges two months ago. The Americans were negotiating with the Japanese, with the South Koreans, with Israel and others to try to get uh, additional uh, ammunition because everyone right, understood right, but, that. But still, yeah. what's the damage? And I'm saying not much. So that, I'm, I'm literally, I'm saying I don't think this is as big of a story. Now, if there are more things that come out 
um, that are truly, I mean, there's nothing that I've seen so far that is close to what we saw during um, the, the, for example, when it turned out that the Americans were spying on Merkel's direct cell phone. Like that, that absolutely that undermined it. I, that was a long time ago. No, I'm saying I don't see what I have seen in the last week. The piece that worried me the most was the fact that the British spy plane was almost shot down. It's a piece of intelligence we need to know that, that you know, frankly, brought the two sides close to a direct shooting war. I, I don't believe that we learned very much that matters okay. on this. And I think that there are a lot of people spreading disinformation that want to make it into more than it actually right. is. Anna. I fully agree. And once again, I think that we have an advantage is that the narrative, the narrative that the United States created with Ukraine at the beginning and with sitting down with the allies and involving the allies has worked extremely well. And frankly, the, the, you Americans, you are very good at many things, but uh, the, the issue of narrative lately was not one of your fortes. This has worked and the, the result is that this issue that could have been in a different context, a big, important blow, it's not. Right. Well, that's reassuring, given <laughs> what we're hearing, and hope that it doesn't continue. Everything. I mean, Macron's done more damage to the coalition yeah, in the okay. last 72 hours than the leak. Let's put it clear. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Yeah, but uh, again, words are words. Deeds are deeds. Right. So, uh, turning to China, last week uh, there was a big full page ad in various newspapers signed by a group of distinguished uh, Americans uh, calling for, it was addressed both to President Biden and President Xi, calling for a new balance in the relationship between uh, China and the United States. Ian, what's the chance of that? Um, a new balance. Uh, there is a new balance. It's not the balance that the Americans and Chinese necessarily want. As we were talking about Russia and as Anna had made her first intervention, I, I note we haven't yet spoken of the global south. Yeah. Let's be clear that um, the overwhelming uh, number of governments that aren't advanced industrial democracies, no matter what flavor of government they have, are, are generally aligned with China, not with the U.S. on the Russia issue, number one. I mean, when, when China put that peace plan out, if you didn't know it was written by China, could have been written by Mexico, Brazil, South Africa, India, doesn't matter. Why right? is that? Uh, because they just don't agree. They see American hypocrisy. They think that if Ukraine were populated by brown people, we wouldn't care as much. If it wasn't directly in Europe, we wouldn't care as much. Same human rights issues. They just don't buy it. And I mean, from their perspective, you can understand why they would say that. They also see the sanctions as hurting them a lot more than they're hurting but, the developed but, world. But the question, and this is a question for all three of you, is the, uh, uh, I guess people are sending questions to me, which I'll read in a minute, but I want to get to the answer. I mean, can U.S. Chinese relations be stabilized? That's the question, and then I want to get I think to that there is, there is a meaningful floor on the U.S.-China relationship. That floor is being tested, and it comes from two different things. First, the reality of significant economic interdependence that is not going away between the U.S. and China. U.S.-China trade relations are at their highest. They're record levels right now. You wouldn't know that from reading the headlines. That's number one. Nor number would you know that from many of the speeches that are being Right. Made. And number two is the fact that outside of the United States, that there is no country that wants to have the kind of decoupling that American congressmen, Democrat and Republican, are talking about on a daily basis. None of them, and you can't very well have a China-U.S. Cold War if you're fighting it by yourselves. So it's not like Russia in that regard. We saw that publicly from Macron, but we hear it privately from all the Europeans, and the Japanese, and the South Koreans, and the Australians. So I think that the, in the same way that I am much more concerned that Russia as a rogue state threatens direct global confrontation in ways that we don't adequately appreciate, I think that there is more stability for external and internal reasons in the U.S.-China relationship than one might think right. from the rhetoric coming out of Washington. Megan? Just, um, again, being contrarian to, to Ian, these things are true. We, we bring yeah. this on the road. <laughs> <laughs> these things are true. I mean, the economic interdependence argument is a strong one. But 
I mean, in the wake of looking at Russia and Europe, I mean, that was the argument for why things were not going to go awry in Europe. So I do think we have a tendency to overestimate how much economic interdependence is a buffer against um, tensions and conflict. Because no, and at if the, the Chinese end of, at invade the end of the Ukraine, day, that will change my view on the European okay, perspective. Yeah. Okay, if the Chinese, I'm not going to bet on that one. No, but I, I, but, think, but I, think, I, I think, Megan, is, what you're getting at is also, and Ian, you mentioned that if the British plane had been shot down by the Russians, if, it's, if there was an accident like that involving China and the United States right now. I'd be less concerned, also, precisely. You'd be, okay, maybe you'd be less concerned, but I don't think it's a reason not to be concerned. I think at the end of the day, I mean, President Xi has made it pretty explicit to American policymakers and really anyone who will listen, Taiwan is a existential issue for China. Do not underestimate how important it is to us strategically. And so I think for us to sit back, and I'm not accusing you of this sitting, entirely. You are, you are sitting back. I'm this is true. But for us to sit back and think that this is that, that, that this is going to, you know, this is a good insurance policy, I, I'm just a little, a little less sanguine. And on the, you know, I think you're exactly right. There are lots of reasons why it's not in either country's interest for this relationship to go through the floor, which has been pretty stable. You know, I'm just nervous about any time that there is the amount of consensus that there seems to be among politicians in Washington, right? That there, there doesn't seem to be a, a, a meaningful voice in Washington pushing back on this idea. And I, I would just, um, you know, if I were speaking to policymakers today, I would simply remind them that if the United States is going to have to rally the rest of the world to its side in a Taiwan contingency or some other incident, it will have paid off in spades to look like we have been responsibly managing the relationship to the rest of the world. So in the United States, there's really no political payoff to look like you're trying to find areas of cooperation, so, but globally there is. Yeah, so I want to ask uh, Anna both how she sees this and then the European views where there's a difference of economic difference in the economic relation. But I was also thinking the last couple of days, remembering that one reads that during the Cuban Missile Crisis, John Kennedy reread The Guns of August, Barbara Tuckman's book about the uh, beginning of the First World War, and I was sort of getting the sense that maybe it's time to reread that book again, but Anna. Well, I think that we have to reread books about the period to uh, 1917 to 1931, in Europe at least. That, for us, is extremely telling. Now, allow me one sentence of, on the Global South. I fully agree with Ian. There is this hypocrisy, and if we speak about energy, the hypocrisy that we have avoided having funding, having multilateral funding for projects of uh, power generation from LNG or from gas or from, from why we were buying this gas to have electricity. And this is true, but there is another component here. And whoever travels in Africa, for instance, you feel it. There is a sense of empowerment that comes from hedging, from the presence of having another alternative. Now, they don't depend on multilaterals, and that, this, I open a parenthesis, is important, the spring meetings. And it's important, the direction that the United States is marking. It's important that your vice, the Vice President uh, Kamala Harris is touring Africa. But, because we, the, there is this sense that, Okay, you know what? You don't fund the Chinese with funds. Right, exactly. Hedging. Of course, and of course that's Hedging. happening. Yeah. And this is happening. Right. And and this is, this gives them an empowerment and a certain aggressiveness that you feel when you have people that you have known for 20 years. I mean, they are the same ones, but the level of assertiveness. Let's put it more. Positive, assertiveness about what? About they them not depending and then pointing at us, especially us. We have. The colonialism yeah. aspect, yeah. because Russia in all these areas has not been colonialist, which of course incensed the, the, yeah. the It was a Latvians. colonial power. Of course, yes. no, it was a colonial power, but, but not uh, in Africa. Right. Right. So, right. But, but let me just ask you, you talked about uh, a leader of a country north of the Pyrenees who was just in China. Uh, Does he reflect uh, a different attitude in Europe towards Chinese no. relations, or does he represent? Honestly, I think if we have to point out something worrisome and important is this just succession of leaders going there. 
one after the other, and not having one message. It's an internal problem of the European Union, but we really have to come to terms of what we want about this important relation uh, with, with China. And yes, there are, I mean, there are discrepancies, and uh, you have at the same time Ursula von der Leyen and, um, well, with a terrible protocol blunder, and this is just, it's her office, but at the same time you have what Pre President Macron said. I mean, again, is it important? Absolutely yes. Has it shaken? Absolutely yes. Is it going to create waves within the European Union? Absolutely yes, and I'm, I'm concerned about that. But is this, does this reflect the, the, the substance of our challenge? Absolutely not. Our challenge is that we go there, I mean, uh, Sean started with this idea of, of Ostpolitik for just having commercial relations. We still define China as a partner, as a competitor, and just third, as a rival. But, and then after Scholz, Louis Michel, the president of the council, and then uh, Sanchez, and then Ursula von der Leyen. This is really terrible image. And this is for us to clean our, our house, because of course the voice of France is important, but France cannot speak for the European Union, right. cannot. And this, you know, we would right. get again into internal uh, European Union policy. So I have some questions from the audience, good ones. I can only ask one of them. I'm going to ask for a very short answer because I want to get to the Middle East. What does the panel think about China's recent war games around Taiwan and the possible threats to energy flows in the South China Sea? China, Sorry, um, their response to the McCarthy engagement with President Tsai was on every front diplomatically, economically, and militarily significantly lower than their escalation and retaliation to Pelosi's trip to Taipei. It was consciously calibrated in a way that would not precipitate a crisis that was noticed by the Taiwanese and the Americans. And again, threats to energy flow in the South China Sea. Um, I, I agree with Ian completely that this wasn't like a particularly disconcerting show of force. And I think there, the question about energy flows and threats to energy flows is sort of separate from the reaction to the, to the Psy McCarthy meeting. Um, I think there are very serious contingencies to be considered about a blockade of Taiwan and about the possibility that the Chinese, you know, that that would be an, a measure that they would consider going forward. And the Taiwanese are beginning to try to be prepared for that, but, you know, are very, very vulnerable on that front. Right. So let's turn to the Middle East. Um, there is the Chinese foreign minister brokering a deal between uh, two implacable enemies, Saudi Arabia and Iran. Megan, what's going on? Well, I think this is indicative of, of larger shifts that we're seeing in the Middle East. And we've been watching these shifts for the last 10 years. And I, I would say this deal, um, the significance of this deal, I think, has yet to be seen. We're not really sure if it is going to play out to be a meaningful detente between these two countries. I think watching Yemen is going to be the most important piece of that. If this material brings down the conflict in Yemen, this will be a meaningful agreement. However, the significance, I think, is much greater than just what this means for tensions between Saudi and Iran and Yemen, which is not small. Um, it is the fact that 10, five, 10 years ago, if you went to China, you talked to the Chinese about their interest in being diplomatically and geopolitically engaged in the Middle East, they would say their interest was zero. That basically they were happy to be economically involved, but they were happy to leave the diplomatic and geopolitical stuff to the United States. They didn't have the appetite, they didn't have the capacity to get involved and play these kinds of roles. That is changing, and there are two, well, there are a number of big things, but one of them is eco economically, China's economics interest in the Middle East have gone up so dramatically that it now needs to be involved diplomatically. And second, um, the United States, the presence of the United States in the Middle East has diminished markedly. Um, I was just in Saudi Arabia and in Iraq, and it's palpable, you know, the feeling that the U.S. is not there 
and that it's, well, not that it's not there at all, but that its commitment to the region is going to be significantly diminished over the long run. And therefore, we have Saudi Arabia and others just making other geopolitical arrangements. Iran and its weapons. Well, I, I was just going to say, uh, the context of what Megan was just saying, there, there, there is a real disadvantage to the fact that in democracies, at a time of global geopolitical change, um, you occasionally elect leaders who care a lot more about themselves and their individual legacies than they do about long-term strategy and placement of their country. We're seeing that with Macron right now, and we've seen it with Trump for four years, and he might come back. The level of damage that will be done by that in the context of Xi Jinping going for 15 years and probably longer with all of the challenges and inefficiencies and opacity and danger of running an authoritarian state capitalist country, the fact is that he's in a position where he can make long-term credible commitments in places around the world. Why is it that Lula is bringing 250 CEOs for a four-day trip to China right now? Why are the Saudis and Iranians meeting in Beijing? That is a big piece of it. It, absolutely, the, 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 the shorter term reality of their economy, the demands they can make, but the fact that they're credible in long term commitments. We haven't yet talked about 2024 in the United States, but every I, single question that we've I, talked about, the, the fact is that uh, on Russia, on China, and the rest, that if that election blows up and if Trump comes back, that's a tail risk that is at least 20%. Right, it's got to be, and, and the implications yeah. of that for the geopolitical order uh, kind of outweigh so much of what we've been I know talking about. Other countries, it's not so far away. Right. Uh, unfortunately, we're not going to have time to talk about that. But I want to give Anna a last word here. Well, on, what I think is important about about what we are seeing in the Middle East is the symbol that China now is opening to the world with an alternative system of our rules-based order, alternative meaning not disrupting, but just taking this system and bringing a different content to the institutions. We have seen it, they have had in, in Beijing a couple of weeks ago, uh, a big meeting of democracy. Well, democracy in a Chinese sense, in, a, in the socialism with a Chinese sense. And this is what is important. Right now, China has this projection of this civilizational, continental, and for the world, an alternative perspective, which is not confrontational, but it's even more, I, I would say, more efficient because it goes behind the doors. It goes in, in uh, putting inside different values, the values of individual, the value of liberty gone, security, the community, in. And this is what, is, what this represents. Right. I think this, uh, first of all, I think yours and uh, Ian's comments really tie together in terms of uh, geopolitical competition. And I think this panel has demonstrated uh, the relationship with geopolitics to the big energy questions. And uh, please join me in thanking our panel. And thank you again, Dan, Anna.